At 15 years old, James had been the figurehead of a rebellion against the king. He was kind of like Katniss Everdeen, I suppose, except far less fucking miserable. And the rebellion had been a success. James's father, James III, he had been ousted from power and he'd been killed. And James, he always felt a, a weight of responsibility for the death of his father. It's said that James wore an iron chain belt that he added a link to every year after his father's death. And if you too would like to purchase yourself a gilt belt, then Primark would probably be the place to go. I don't think you can buy much in there. Guilt free. Well, to be fair, like Pandora seemed to have the whole gilt accessory market cornered, don't they? Imagine like, imagine if Matt Hancock had to add a link to a belt for every death that he was responsible for. The guy would be at the fucking centre of the earth right now. Now, James IV, he was a very handsome, charismatic, athletic, intelligent king. He was a phenomenal linguist. James, he could speak French, German, Spanish, Italian, Danish, Flemish, Latin. He was the last king of Scotland with the ability to speak fluently in Gaelic, which made him incredibly popular with the Highlanders because they couldn't. Uh, he was really into hawking, which is a tad strange for, uh, for such a keen linguist because I thought he'd be more like the duolingo owl. <laughs> uh, he was into fencing He was into archery Poetry, drinking, gambling He was kind of like the Sean Connery Of Scottish kings uh, He was like the James Bond Of Scottish kings And by that I mean he didn't treat women particularly well Throughout his informative years James, he was fed a series of mistresses By men looking to further themselves Politically like Acting kind of like Tiger Woods' caddy I suppose. And by the time of his marriage to Margaret Tudor in 1503, James, he already had four children by three different women. He's remembered in Scotland as the Lee Griffiths King. And James, he was becoming incredibly popular incredibly quickly because of his ability to stand up to the English kings, Henry VII and then Henry VIII. When Henry VII was facing a Yorkist comeback led by their new leader, Marcelo Bielsa, James IV, he took the opportunity to batter the castles of Northern England because he was Scottish. I mean, we'll batter anything, you can. And his reward was a peace treaty in which he would be rewarded with a marriage to Henry VII's daughter, Margaret Tudor. The marriage of the, the, the thistle and the rose, which took place on the 8th of August, 1503 at Holyrood Palace. This is a seminal moment in Anglo-Scottish relations because it would be James and Margaret's great-grandson, James VI, 100 years later, who would inherit the throne of England and become the first king of England and Scotland. Now, the thistle, it's probably the most recognisable of Scottish emblems. And it makes perfect sense as a symbol of Scotland because this is a country that is full of pricks, folks. I can assure you that. And apparently, it's been a symbol of Scotland ever since the, the time of the Vikings. Um, and basically, the Vikings, they were on a nighttime raid and they were trying to sneak up on a Scots encampment when one of the Vikings trod on a thistle and yelped out in pain, alerting the Scots to their presence. The thistle has been an emblem of Scotland ever since, and the phrase, oof ya cunt ye, has been our kind of national motto ever since. And James, he's the Renaissance king. Under his reign, the arts, literature, science and philosophy, they all flourished. James, he installed the first printing press on Edinburgh's Cowgate in 1507. I'm sure he'd be delighted to learn that it's been made into student accommodation. And he spent fortunes on creating a Scottish Royal Navy. His most famous ship that he built, the Great Michael, it weighed over 500 tonnes. It had over 30 bronze cannons and is said to have wasted all of the wood and fife. The only way in which they can get wood and fife now is if they see an attractive cousin, you know? And in truth, the, the Great Michael is a bit of a floating disaster. She really have called it the Great Michael Barrymore. Uh, and what, the, what this kind of huge Scottish fleet, the benefit it had to Scotland is debatable. It didn't really deter anyone from attacking us. It was more just to improve our prestige on the international stage. Basically, the exact same reasons why Scotland still houses nuclear weapons to this day. But there's no doubting that under the reign, under the rule of James IV, Scotland was self-confident it was cultured, it was at the forefront of European politics and it was not to be messed with. But of course, it was all going to come tumbling down pretty soon. Henry VIII, he entered into an alliance with uh, Spain, Venice and the Papal State against the French. And as part of the, the old alliance of 1295, 
the French, they once again asked Scotland to create a, a distraction by invading the north of England. And this would lead to arguably the most disastrous moment in Scottish history, the Battle of Flodden fought on the 9th of September, 1513. The most well-equipped, the largest Scottish army to ever enter into England was completely decimated. 5,000 Scotsmen were killed on the day, including James IV. Now, James, he was so chivalrous that he felt the need to write to Henry VIII to let him know that he planned on invading Northern England, acting kind of like, like he didn't want to put him out like he was visiting his in-laws or something like that. And then he rode at the front of his army, on the front lines, leaving the army leaderless while he was shaking hands with COVID patients, whatever it is. And he was killed. James IV's body was so badly mutilated that his body wasn't recognised until the next day. He was like Amanda Holden after having another fucking Botox injection. His body was embalmed and it was sent to a monastery in Surrey. But then after the English Reformation, with the dissolution of the monasteries, it was put into a timber room at the back of the monastery. And it wasn't found for another hundred years later where some workmen found his body and they started to play football with his head. Imagine that. Like, imagine coming across a dead body and the first thing that you decide to do is to play football with his head. Only Matt Hancock could be more disrespectful to the dead. This fucking stupid smirking face. The head was recovered by uh, Elizabeth I's um, glazier, Lancelot Young, who had the head placed on his mantelpiece, which incidentally, by the way, is what Piri Patel does as well. I mean, she's one Syrian granny away from having the entire set. Now, eventually, James's body, it was, it was placed in a grave at, uh, at St. Michael's Church on Wood Street in London. There's now a, an insurance building there. And so... One of Scotland's most charismatic, important kings is buried headless underneath an insurance building in London. And I'm fairly certain that the British media is not going to stop until Alex Salmond suffered the same fate. And it is the reign of James IV's son, James V, which I'm going to speak to you guys about next time. Thank you very much for listening.